The heart of the ceremony are seven blessings, and in Hebrew they're called the Shevar Brachot. To teach and share this evening is my bride, Rabbi Amy S. Walk. Now, normally on Shabbat, we watch each other's sermons and services, and after the fact, we reflect and consider, like, I'm dying, you're sitting right here, I'm like, okay, so what do you think of that side? <laughs> right. um, what a treat that we get to be in time right here, real time. Following those words, our cantorial solo is Jason McKinney, um, who is my friend and partner in singing. Um, we'll sing the Sheva Brachot and our own Neil Maxi, who is piano playing, let alone Neil, your neshuma, your soul, fill our space here regularly, will play. We feel very much, and already do so, feel very, very blessed. You're on. <laughs> I am, I am. So, so first I have to say, when I'm on a colleague's bima, I always refer to that colleague as rabbi, right? Rabbi Cohn, Rabbi Cohn. My childhood rabbi's wife never referred to him by his first name. When she would be talking to my mother, she would always say, the rabbi, the rabbi. So as a little girl, I thought his first name was Rabbi. But on this colleague's bima, I'm going to refer to him as Mark, or my husband. I feel like that's OK. So we were married in San Francisco because that's Mark's home. And it seemed most appropriate to me. My own parents are deceased. And so my attachments to my childhood home, Chicago, weren't, it wasn't compelling enough to have a wedding there when we could be in a place where Mark's mother lives, his siblings are there, and it just felt like the menchi thing to do. So there we were in San Francisco, and the Sheva Brachot recited, and I decided I wanted to teach them this evening because at a wedding, you don't really study them. You shouldn't actually study them. You should enjoy them. And they're really important, and they have a really powerful message that aren't just about the couple, but they're really for each and every one of us. On the screen, you have this beautiful selection of the Sheva Brachot. Maybe you recognize the artist as David Moss. Those of you who study with Mark, you know you've been studying his The Moss Haggadah. I mean, these, this particular set was a gift to me from a new friend. And that gift actually inspired me to say, so what's in the Sheva Brachot? What's in them? So before we dig into the text, I want to remind you, Sheva Brachot means the seven blessings. And I want to remind you that seven is a very significant number. Now, unlike Mark, I don't teach numbers. If my <laughs> congregants, never. If my congregants are watching, they're going to say, what's happening? But we don't care about Gematria tonight, not even a little. But, uh, sorry. <laughs> but seven is significant in Judaism because it's about being complete or whole. And I'm going to remind you that after somebody dies, we often talk about sitting Shiva. Well, Shiva and Sheva are from the same root. And traditionally, one would sit Shiva for seven days, right? Because it's a week of complete mourning. I'm going to remind you that Thomas Kael in his book, The Gift of the Jew, says that one of the things the Jews brought the world was the idea of a seven-day week with a Sabbath. Sometimes I think, wouldn't it be nice if we had an eighth day? But then I know that it would just get filled up, so I'm going to stick with seven. And I, but this idea, seriously, that is so fundamental to how our world operates, that's ours. It's the number seven. So the seven days of the week, the seven days of creation, the period of Shiva, when a baby has a brit milah, it's on the eighth day, but it's the, immediately after that first full week of life. So for all those reasons, seven is a sacred and significant moment. The truth is one of my favorite moments on our wedding day was the singing of the Sheva Brachot. And what I want to tell you is Mark actually made that moment for me. He chose the music. And in a certain way, it's emblematic of our relationship. So many times, Mark takes something I know and I appreciate, and he just makes it better. He deepens it. He deepens my appreciation, or he offers another perspective. And this was a great example. I've never enjoyed the Sheva Brachot at a wedding 
the way I did at our wedding. And it's largely because of the music, which we'll experience in just a little bit. So what might you expect? Imagine you're the author and you're writing seven blessings for a couple. Well, what would you put in those blessings? If you want to answer, you can, but I'm imagining a prayer for good health. You would want the couple to have mazel, a long life. You might make a prayer like, I hope they get along with the in-laws. You might like, right? You might like, these days we'd say something like, we hope they both get jobs in the same community. For a younger couple, you might say, we hope they're blessed with many children. Right, that would be the kind of thing. And what I want to say to you is, shockingly, that's not actually what's in our Sheva Brachot. Our Sheva Brachot that were written or composed about 2,000 years ago or so actually offer a very different perspective. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to show you how they talk about the couple appreciating love. They talk about the couple going from two to one. And they talk about the couple's duty to their people, all in the context of serving God. So it's about love, two to one, and serving others. And what I want to do now is take you through that and show you those three themes. So the first three blessings begin, and we can go to the next slide. The first three blessings begin by, by saying to God, thanking God for creating the fruit on the vine, thanking God for creating everything for God's glory, and thanking God for creating humanity. That's kind of a context. Thank you, God, for creating the, and the, the Borei Pri Hagafen is its own thing. Another time we could talk about how it's used in Kiddush and how it's used in Havdalah, and that Borei Pri Hagafen finds itself. But for now, I'm just going to say the wedding ceremony is called Kiddushin. In a little while, I think we're going to be reciting Kiddush. It's the same root. It's what makes the moment sacred. And the truth is the wedding ceremony is about a bride and a groom saying to one another, you're sacred to me. There's no one in the whole world who relates to me the way you do. So that's there. And then the other two blessings are about God created all things in glory and God created humanity. And it really gets interesting now when we get to the fourth blessing. So the fourth blessing says, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who made human beings in your image after your likeness and have enabled us with the potential for eternal continuity. Blessed are you, O Lord, creator of humanity. So this fourth blessing starts by saying, you know, you are made in God's image. And in a certain way, there's a little bit of foreshadowing going on because what it's hinting at is you have potential. You are made in God's image, and so you have the ability to do, to flourish through time. You are created in God's image, and that means you, bride and groom, are able to do great things. And that's the fourth blessing. But let's look what happens when we get to the fifth blessing. The fifth blessing reads, may she who was barren be exceedingly glad and exult when her children are gathered within her. So stop for a minute. We are at a wedding. Who's the she? Who's barren? Really? In the middle of the Sheva Brachot, we're going to sit there and say, may she who was barren, and another translation, may Israel, once bereft of her children, now delight as her children gather together in her joy? What's going on here? And then the text says, blessed are you, O Lord, who makes Zion joyful through her children. What is that about? So I want to say two things about this blessing. We do this in a moment of great joy, that is, you and I do this, we pause and we remember something that isn't right or something that's missing. And I'll give you an example. I'm going to explain it in an individual way, and then I'm going to talk about it for the community. So for an individual way, my father died 29 years ago. It would be inconceivable for me to have a celebration without invoking my father's Torah. My mother died six years ago. It would be inconceivable, I'm not good with numbers, I told you. It would be inconceivable for me. When Mark and I got married, it was actually really important to us that the rabbi who married us knew my parents and knew Mark's parents. That he was able to honor my father and mother and Mark's father, father and greet Robbie and be there. I needed that. How could I get married without invoking my parents into that ceremony? And the truth is, one of the sweetest moments of our wedding 
I had a lot of sweet moments because it was a really sweet day. But in the reception, my daughter talked about my parents' love. And she hoped that we would have a love like that. And I thought to myself, my dad's here, even though he couldn't be with us. He's here with us. And so that's this way that as individuals, and I'm imagining you've done the same thing at your simchas, where you've talked about parents or grandparents, because how do you sit there and be in a simcha without remembering the people who made it possible? So what does that have to do with may she who was barren? So the answer is, just as we do that as individuals, the rabbis were doing that for us as a people. The rabbis were saying, wait, we're at a big celebration? In the midst of this celebration, we have to remember what has befallen our people. So you and me in the year 2022, we don't do that with the destruction of the temple. The way we do that as a people is we often invoke the Holocaust. How many of you have used to Haggadah where there aren't four children, but there's five, and the fifth child is a child who perished, who wasn't even alive to ask a question? Right? How many times have we talked about, taken a moment, and we've remembered the Holocaust? So the rabbis, 2,000 years ago, for them, the catastrophe of the Holocaust, for them, the temple being destroyed was every bit as catastrophic. And so there they are composing blessings, and what are they doing? They're saying... We're under a chuppah, the bride and groom, they're happy, and they're saying, may she who was barren, like, may the city of Jerusalem, may Israel, once bereft of her children, now delight as her children gather together in her city. In a certain way, what's happening here is they're pushing the bride and groom. Think about Jerusalem. But remember, this is only the fifth blessing. I have two more to go. I want to pause for a moment and just say something to you about Jerusalem. Mark, as and I, you heard, we met in Jerusalem. We were both galled to Jerusalem in the summer of 2017. That is, our souls called us to Jerusalem. We were both in need of healing. We were both in need of light. We were both in need of Torah. We were both in need of regrouping. Mark didn't tell you that within the first 15 minutes that we met, I started to cry because I was in the period of Shloshim for my oldest brother. And as we talked about who knows what, there I am looking for Kleenex, sobbing. In that moment in which we were needed healing and we were broken, my children like to say, we went to rabbi camp. <laughs> yes, for both of us, that's what studying at the Shalom Hartman Institute is. It's rabbi camp. Jerusalem, the modern state of Israel, it nourishes us in a way that is simply indescribable. And that's another thing I love about Mark. He gets it. He gets me. He gets that I love Israel. He gets that I sometimes need to criticize Israel. He gets that I truly believe in my heart that each and every one of us is missing out by not living in our people's homeland. And yet, like me, he gets why I'm here, why I feel very, very fulfilled and grateful to be an American citizen. And so I don't have to explain this mishmash in my heart. The other thing I want to say to you about Jerusalem and our wedding is that the rabbi who officiated, Rabbi David Ellenson, gave the most incredible teaching about Psalm 122. And he spoke about our love of Israel and our being called to Jerusalem. And yes, that was another favorite moment of our wedding. As you can see, I have many. And I will tell you that Psalm 122 will never be the same. But now I want to take us back to the sixth bracha. So let's look at this one. Oh, make these beloved partners greatly rejoice, just as once you gladden the creatures in Eden. Blessed are you, O Lord, who causes groom and bride to rejoice. And look at the language. We ask God to give the bride and the groom that joy which was known in the Garden of Eden, pure and simple. We ask that the bride and groom that become partners. And yet the bracha says, and it concludes, who causes the groom and the bride to rejoice. So first of all, I want to just remind you that the Sheva Brachot don't take it for granted. The rabbis got it. Being in love and having a friend and a companion is hard work. And the Sheva Brachot are turning 
to God and saying, let them have it like in the Garden of Eden. Let it be that easy. But notice the blessing ends and says, who causes groom and bride to rejoice. We're separate there. We're not together. I want to just say something about this in this context and the next. I want to contrast the Sheva Brachot with the Ketubah. Those of you who have ever looked at a Ketubah, it's a pretty dry document, also written about 2,000 years ago. It spells out the financial obligations. The old Ketubah, the ancient Ketubah, the man acquired a woman and it was an economic obligation. And even the modern Ketubah, the couple acquires one another and it more or less expresses their duties and obligations to one another. If you see ketubot that have lovey-dovey language in it, it's not a translation or close to the traditional. It's beautiful. Ours actually has very, very, very little English that you need a, micro, a, micro, a microscope to read or a magnifying glass. It says some of the lovey-dovey stuff, but that's not part of the tradition. But what I want to say to you is with the Sheva Brachot, it balances out the ketubah. The rabbis actually understood this couple needs love and companionship and friendship. And so it's the, it, is the, it is the balance of the ketubah that spells out obligation and duty. These talk about love. And here we have in the sixth blessing, okay, may they have love like the couple in Eden. Adam and Eve. Great. Let's go to the seventh bracha. And this last blessing, again, reiterates that this, this relationship, it's hard. So look what the rabbis do. They say, blessed are you, O Lord, ruler of the universe. You made joy and gladness, groom and bride, mirth and exaltation, pleasure and delight, love, brotherhood, peace and fellowship. And in Hebrew, it's sason, simcha, chatan, kala, gila, rina, ditza, chedva, ahava, v'shalom. All these words to describe what we want for the couple. Happiness, contentment, love, companionship, peace, friendship. The bridegroom and the bride. That's what we want for them. And the blessing is going on and saying, huh, that's hard. But look what happens next. It's like, that should be the end. Isn't that what we want? But it goes on and it says, soon may there be heard in the cities of the Judah. We're back to the destruction of the temple, folks. And it says, soon may it be heard in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the joy, the voice of the groom and the bride, the jubilant voice of grooms from their canopies and of youths from their feast of song. So look what happens now. The rabbis don't just want us to be happy. It's almost as if the rabbis knew what a bridezilla, or as I like to call, a groomzilla are. The rabbis are turning to the bride and groom and saying, you think it's all about you, because you feel like it's all about you. It is not all about you. It is about you harnessing your energy and your love and spreading it. And it is about you remembering that this world needs your energy. So you may want to only focus on your love, and your joy, and your companionship. But that's not what it's about. It's about looking. And I want you to notice, the rabbis do not talk about any old place that's broken. They say one day in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Even tonight, Mark managed to put in a little something about the pull between the particular and the universal. I caught that at Shalom Rav. When he said, it's not just in the moment, this is about us. The truth is the rabbis are turning to the couple and saying, you know what, couple, happy couple? It is not just about you. It is not just about your family. It is actually not just about your community, your little community. It's about the Jewish people and the pull of the land of Zion. Should be, you should be feeling the pull of the land of Zion. And so for me, that, that becomes a significant piece of this last blessing, which is it's not about the couple. It is, but it isn't. The, and the end, I want you to notice, it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the groom rejoice with the bride. So if you were to look back, and the, the other, the sixth blessing, it was, who causes groom and bride to rejoice. 
And you could sit there and say, well, what's the difference between and and with? And actually a lot, right? It's the difference between two individuals. And when it says, turns to God and said, the groom rejoices with the bride, they become one. So in a very different context, I was having a conversation with a, a, someone in my congregation. And she said, she said, well, two is often stronger than one. She said, imagine if you have one pencil and you try and break it, you can break it pretty easily. But if you have two pencils and they're together, it's actually harder to break it because they hold each other up. They give each other strength. It's a great metaphor, and I think that's the difference between, lessons, between blessing six and blessing seven. And yes, that's also where I want to say just one more thing about Mark. That business about the pull between the universal and the particular, that's another thing we share. We worry a lot about our people, and we feel duty-bound to worry about the universal. And finding the right equation is hard. And he gets me when I feel like I need to recalibrate. And I hope I get him when he feels that he needs to recalibrate. And it's not something that a lot of people have the flexibility, they're not nimble enough necessarily, or nimble in our language, to understand the struggle that we feel. But we feel it, and the truth is, as leaders in the American Jewish community, we better feel it. So the and and the with, one pencil, many pencils, the end of the bracha, the language is saying something very important about the bride and the groom and the two individuals coming together and they are one and together they're stronger. This blessing has new meaning for me and I understand what it means in ways I never did before I met Mark. Indeed, as Mark and I brought our lives together, we had so many questions to answer. Where would we live? Who would remain the pulpit rabbi? How would we create a life that would allow us to grow as individuals and as a couple? How would we make space for our five children? You all know Harley and Eitan. They grew up here. You should know I have three children of my own, Tamar, Gabriel, and Nina. they 28 to 20. And we love all five of them. And we want to make space for all five of them. But we don't want them living with us. But we want to make space for them. <laughs> In addition to the questions that we asked about ourselves, the rabbis say, Amy, Mark, bridegroom, here's the question you and every wedding couple have to ask. How will you nourish your love and friendship and also serve your people? In these Sheva Brachot, that's what they're saying. How will you nourish your love and friendship and also serve your people? Truly, these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. How do we nourish our own souls while also remembering that our people in, are in need? How do we nourish our own souls while also fulfilling our obligations to our people in our local community, to our people throughout the world, and of course, to our people in Israel? How do we ensure our own joy while also making time to ensure that our brothers and sisters, wherever they are, are able to celebrate and rejoice. I actually don't have the answers, but I know that if we ask these questions and we truly think about these important issues, we'll find our way and we'll find our way. And I do believe that this is the profound underlying message of the Sheva Brachot. Love. Celebrate it. Nurture it. Two become one. And those two who become one serve their people. And that, after all, is what God wants of us and for us. God wants us to be happy and feel loved. In Genesis, God says it's not good for man to be alone. God wants us to experience intimacy. But God also wants us to look beyond ourselves and our experiences. May we each find joy and friendship 
May we celebrate many good times. And at the same time, may we commit ourselves to work for the day that Jews throughout the world can celebrate with a full heart, just as the bride and groom do on their wedding day, just as Mark and I were so fortunate to be able to do on our wedding day. Kenya Hiratsa. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I think you did just fine. Um, I think. <laughs> I was very nervous. <laughs> very, very. I I had um had this great idea back in November. Or so I'm like, oh, it's be great. I'll speak at your place. You'll speak at mine, um, and that's what we did. But then when you're suddenly on on the other person's pulpit, <laughs> it's a whole other experience. Yes, I mean this. Now you can imagine <laughs> the conversations that that we get to have, and I um, am so blessed for your Torah and teaching and this. I was, I'm, I'm sitting and you're standing here, speaking, and behind us here are the the life cycle names of God that are used either initially or exclusively with, with that life cycle. So birth, is we call upon God, Shechianu, God who gives us our life. At a bar by mitzvah, God is the one who is noten Torah, God is the one who gives Torah. And at a wedding, Mesameach chatan im hakala, that God is the one who causes the groom to rejoice with the bride. It's that end of the seventh blessing. And then El Malei Rachamim, God is the one who is filled with mercy. And it makes that whole circle eight years since your mom died. <laughs> <laughs> I try, try, try to keep the family tree. <laughs> um, and, and so that you're standing right underneath that and that we get to celebrate. This is the, the Bema, our community, communities, um, that we very much see ourselves a part of that and couldn't possibly imagine not celebrating in some capacity um, with our communities because um, as much as we stand with our congregants on a number of occasions, and as I'm looking through the room, I like, okay, I remember that. But we celebrated a lot together, all of those cycles, multiple, and sometimes around the wheel a few times. Um, that that's, um, it's, it's such a blessing for us to get to stand with our community, with all of you on this day, and, and I could celebrate this simcha. So we have a, a lot of candy up here. Um, <laughs> the Shever Brachot, Jason. Neil, when you're ready. Now, There's... if you were to step off, I could take my mask off. All right, then. I'm... <laughs> we're taking our kiddush cup with us. I think we'll stand right over here so we can still see Jason. Look at that, Punam. He makes, he it's makes so sure nice to it's... see you, Jason. I know, right? <laughs> and now I actually have to smile when I sing. <laughs> Aruchat Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Melech Olam Ore Peri Agafen Ore Peri Oh, 
amen, 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 amen. So stars